Having successfully launched three businesses, Bilingual Mum to Two and entrepreneur Antonia Bovesan Brown has connected with thousands of people, both French and international, since moving to the French Riviera. These connections allow her to speak to successful local businesses and inspirational people about life here on the Côte d'Azur and share it with you. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast with your host, entrepreneur and my mum, Antonia Bovesan Brown. Welcome to the Riviera Firefly podcast to James Vassi, my first author. Hello. Hi. Hi. It's very nice to be here. <laughs> and yet you're not here. Where are you? <laughs> I'm in Allenmouth on the beautiful Northumberland coast at the moment in our other home. And it sounds, I think, chatting before, it sounds like we've got similar weather. It's not blazing sunshine there and it's not blazing sunshine here. Uh, no, it's it's quite bright today. It's it's not an unpleasant day when the snow and the, the frost is gone, so it's uh, it's not unpleasant. I'm looking down the sea, which is a bit grey, but the uh, sun on the beach, so that's that's okay. And you basically live the dream. You split your time between the UK and Europe. Yes, we do. Yeah, because we, we obviously have family here and grandchildren, and uh, we need to be backwards and forwards. But um, yeah, about fifty fifty. That's brilliant. That's what a great way to live. So I can detect a little bit of an accent and I obviously know where you come from, but our listeners don't know where you come from. Uh, where are you from in the UK originally? Oh, we're from north of England, so not too far from Newcastle. So I'm what we're, we're known as Geordies up here. <laughs> One of the favourite accents, I think, isn't it, of all time? Yes, I believe it's, uh, it's certainly the flavour of the month at the moment, yes. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your background and what took you over to the place in Europe that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Okay, well, I, about 20 years ago, I, I read a book um, called Extra Virgin by Annie Hawes. Um, and uh, it was about her experience of um, discovering Liguria on a working holiday and then subsequently buying a home there and moving out there and um, uh, making her life there, and I believe she's still there right now. The the slightly unusual thing about the book was it was it was although it was a, largely a, a travelogue, there was a lot of social history and um, a deep understanding of the kind of food culture of Liguria, and that was one of the things that attracted me um, to the area. So I I got on a plane and I went to flew to Genoa and um, spent. 10 or 15 years visiting different villages along the along the coast until we eventually found Saborga a few years ago. Which is so similar to my story, except it was to France that we came because it was a year in Provence and all those kind of books with the French life okay. and that. So it does plant that seed. It's the power of literature, isn't it? It plants that seed. And, and if you've got a bit of wonder lost in you and you want to go and travel and see different places. So you ended up in the de facto micronation of Saborga, not a place that everyone will know about. It sounds incredibly remote and exotic, but when I looked on the map earlier, I was like, it's under an hour from Nice. I just didn't know it was that close. That's right, yes, it's, a, it's an undiscovered gem that's actually very, very accessible, yeah. We're, I think 35 minutes from Monte Carlo. Um, and uh, we, in fact, from our house, we, could, we look down on Monte Carlo. Um, uh, so we see the, night, the lights glittering at night, um, all the way where I tucked up in the mountains behind. And it has princes and princesses and things like that. There's, is it, who's your current prince? Prince Marcello, is that still the person or is there a bit of dispute on that? Uh, no, Prince Marcello and uh, Princess Nina are still the, uh, the, the, the ruling monarchs uh, of, our, of our principality. And what does that mean? Because it, so it's not part of Italy. Do they have their own rules, their own laws? How how does it work? Well, that's, that's the extraordinary story. It it it, it claim dates back to the the Templars when the um, they were fighting the the Holy Wars. They used um, the, that part of Italy as a kind of jumping off point to um, to either um, continue a journey by road <clears throat> um, round to um, the Holy Land or, or by sea. Um, so they set up a kind of fortress base there in an existing monastery um, uh, where Saborga is now. The Pope encouraged them to go to the Holy Land and fight these wars. Um, so he gifted them the, the area and, and deemed it a principality so they could make up their own rules and their own laws um, and, and 
protect it in the, in the way that the Templars saw, saw fit. The residents of Saborga claim that that principality status was never legally changed and so that they in fact, in fact are still uh, independent. Unfortunately, uh, nobody much outside of Saborga recognizes this status. Um, what's really unusual is that, you know, although most people realize that, um, you know, the independence is never going to be recognized, um, they play out this, um, this role um, and the, all residents are happy to go along with it. So we, we still have a prince and we have a princess. People acknowledge them for what they are um, and they uh, participate in ceremonies and rituals. Um, uh, so it gives the place an extraordinary air. It, it's, it's, really, you know, it's in the real world, but not, not quite. In fact, Linda McCluskey, uh, an American artist who also moved into the village, described her experience as, as, as like Alice um, falling down the rabbit hole and waking up in a wonderful um, uh, fairyland. Um, and that's kind of a bit what it's like sometimes. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's somehow, um, in fact, somebody who read the book said it was otherworldly. It felt otherworldly. And I think that's probably a good, ex good, good expression. Yeah, it just sounds like this little gem that's that's just hidden away that we don't know about. And in fact, it came onto my radar uh, with one of our mutual connections, Mark Dazani, who was putting together um, programs and ideas to go into the election, I believe, to become the Prince of Saborga. How would that ever work to have a non-Italian being the prince? Do you think how how would that be accepted? Well, it's interesting. I, th th this idea of an elected prince is, is again is pretty unusual, but it, it, it goes back to the Templars because the, the Templars were, were a de democratic society and they, they elected their, their their leader, their ruler. Um, so that's how this this election came about, um, and. I, and I suppose because um, the Templars were, were made up of other Europeans, there were, there were, there were French and English and, and some Eastern Europeans as well, all contributed night to the battle. I suppose in that sense, um, Saborga is, still sees itself as, as slightly independent and, uh, and therefore perhaps the idea of, of, a, of an English prince isn't quite so extraordinary. Well, then I'll cross my fingers for Mark in the future because I'd love to have a prince in my entourage. It'd be great. <laughs> the book is called Cooking Up a Country and it's a, it's a romance book with uh, Italian cookbook fusion, isn't it? So is it based at all on, on your own background? I suppose, you know, all, all, all writers, you know, use the, use the knowledge that they have and their own experiences in, you know, uh, uh, the basis of their characters. Um, but not really, no. I, I set out to tell the story of Saborga, and I used uh, a, an Englishman, a fictional Englishman, as, as the vehicle to do that. So I suppose in the sense he arrived in the village like I did, unknowing. What's different in my story is that an, an Italian chef teaches him the history of, of the village and then about the culture and then about the food. And, and through that process, he falls in, he falls in love with the village and perhaps even her and the, and that's the that's the vehicle that, that that tells the story of of, of the templars and the you know the, the the prince and the princess and they go off on this journey of discovery and the recipes obviously you've had to do lots and lots of research into all the different types of italian recipes are you a huge chef yourself <laughs> i'm not a chef i have chef friends and uh, i am quite a foodie so yes that was that was the the, the dirty job that somebody had to do <laughs> was to go and eat lots lots of food and drink lots of wine in, in the name of research um so i you know i put myself to it and uh, got on with it give us some of the more unusual recipes that they discover in and through the journey of the book okay well the theme that i want, really wanted to get over was that Unique um, Cucina Bianca um, of, of the Ligurian um, mountain uh, maritime Alps, because it's it's determined by by the geography. Because the the, the Mediterranean climbs pretty quickly to the maritime Alps, there is virtually no fertile land for grazing animals. Um, so so meat and beef, certainly red meat, isn't part of the of the, of the cuisine of the area. It's determined pretty much by the uh, by that geography, so the, the seafood, if you, if for the villages that are pretty close to the sea, once they climb up, then they're pretty much relying upon what you can find in the mountains, which tends to be um, 
uh, chestnuts and, um, and and forest fruits and any meat would come from wild boar or from uh, from game. So it it had the tendency to make um, what was on the plate um, tend to be white or pale colours, hence the cucina bianca. Uh, rabbit is a, is a popular dish there. And I just found it fascinating discovering how um, the geography had influenced the, the, the native cuisine and that that had pretty much man, been maintained, despite the fact that now people had access to all the same ingredients as everywhere else. The, 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 re, the menus hadn't really changed very much. And they were, they were based in this belief that there was a benefit in, in using what was nearby, uh, what was available, and when it was in season. And then I made that connection with the, the slow, slow food movement, and that's basically their ethos. So I, I began to realize that what in fact was happening is that the, the, the villages, the mountain villages of, of Liguria were practicing slow food um, without actually knowing what slow food was or, or understanding that, that movement. And, and it struck me one day, like looking out of a, of, a, uh, of a kitchen window in one of these lovely hilltop houses, that people ate what they could see from that window. And if you couldn't see it from that window, if it wasn't growing or it wasn't running around in the forest, it wasn't on the menu. And it was pretty, pretty much as simple as that. Which is such a great way to be. And I love to see that the trend is moving back to that, to sort of provenance, artisan something that's you know got high value and low impact low carbon footprint that kind of thing really something that's kind of authentic and local it's great to see that that's what tourists are moving back to really and that we're sort of moving away from the big chains and you know just even the plastic movement that kind of thing that's why i I, i've named each of the chapters after a dish because if you follow that uh, logic through then a dish that's been consumed, that bit of the story, should should tell you, should put it in context, it should tell you where it is, and you should be able to, to know even what time of day it's been eaten. The first chapter, chapter is Coquille Saint-Jacques, or again, that, that part of the story is set on the uh, on the west coast of France, so it's next to the ocean, it's, you know, you kind of know if, you, if you're eating that, it's, um, uh, you know, you're in that kind of uh, area around Bordeaux, Laura Shell. And then the, the next chapter, I think, I believe is, is Kippa. And that takes us back to the UK because the protagonist um, uh, enters the story at that stage. And he's in the northeast of England. And the Kippa was a, a, a poor, poor man's, working man's dish. It was cheap and, cheap and available. And so it, it kind of puts it in, in context. And then there's, there's another one that, that puts us in Provence, in, in protagonist arrives when Ben arrives here. You know, he's fleetingly in, in, in the south of France. And so what he eats on that particular day places him pretty firmly in that area because it's, it's got preserved lemons and it's got cumin and um, North African influences that you just wouldn't get if you drove 30 minutes over the border. All those kind of uh, flavours and ingredients disappear immediately once you get into, into Italy. It's such a rich journey that we get to go through. And it's so nice living here in the Côte d'Azur and sort of seeing things that you know and can relate to and then discovering new things. It's a brilliant accomplishment. Now, I know that your background, you were a university lecturer. Did that sort of help and prepare you for the whole book writing process? In one sense it did, because I, I taught marketing, business, business and marketing, and there is an element of, of marketing and economics in the story because the protagonist is challenged with trying to find an economic model for these villages, which will carry them into the 21st century because the, the economies that have served them well for a thousand years, you know, self, self-sustaining, growing what you need, what you need is failing. It doesn't work uh, for, for, a, for, a, for a new generation. So the villages are starting to be depopulated and, and replaced with large with people like me, incoming tourists or, or second home dwellers. And, and that's good for the economy only in certain ways. It, it still needs really a core community who are working and, and making their living from the village. Otherwise, they start to become a shell of, of what they were. And I, I use the example of Es, es Village, which has kind of you know, become just a, an empty kind of tourist village that's full of shops and restaurants. Um, and, and no, you know, uh, local population there. So, so, so Ben is challenged with, with, with trying to come up with an economic model, and he uses his marketing background to, to, to do that. And how did you sort of set about? So you, you've got your idea, 
How did you set about getting it down on paper? Were you quite regimented about it? Did you have set times every day? I'm fascinated to know how the process works. I, I, no, I didn't. And I, of course, I've never done this before. So you know, this is, I was in uncharted territory. I just said, well, I start, I'd started with a, with a short story. I wrote a 3,000 word short story, which was, was an elongated synopsis, I suppose. So that, that gave me a framework. But even in that, I didn't really know, there wasn't clearly much detail, and I didn't really have a, a, a very good ending. It told the story of, of, of Saborga, effectively enough, but there wasn't much to engage people you know, through, through the length of a book. That came later. But no, I, I just sat down one day, and um, I, I, was, I wrote most of it in Italy, set two in the afternoon, like some of those might got too hot to, to really be outside. And, um, and that was the easy bit, really. I, it flowed pretty quickly. I mean, I could easily write, you know, 3,000 words in a, in a day without much trouble. What kind of skills do you think one has to have in order to be a good creative author? Well, what, what skills I have, I've, I've acquired since starting this. I, mean, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't know really anything about this, but I, 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 I had a friend and mentor who, who was a colleague at, at the university. He taught creative writing, so he was very helpful. I bought a book called How to Write a Book by Harry Bingham, which I have to say was extremely helpful. Um, uh, and uh, that taught me a lot about structure, really, and um, uh, you know, dividing up the, uh, the story into, uh, into sections that made sense and led off on a path um, towards an ending. And then, uh, of course, there were the inevitable many rewrites. I'd get it version finished and I thought was okay and then let people uh, like my friend and mentor read it and then they'd come back with lots of feedback that you know meant rewriting it all again so I think probably four rewrites (laughs) in I was kind of getting the stage where really I'd had enough I mean I'd I'd read it and reread it and rewritten it so many times but even when I look at it now I still think well you know maybe there are bits I'd change but I think that's the process of yeah it's you know, it's never really finished. But, you know, and I'd really like to get on to the next one. What happens when you finish the book? Does, does Ben carry on living in your head, sort of creating mischief or? Even before I'd finished the book, I always knew there was the potential for a second story because the, the, the two characters had the potential to go on and do other things. And, and there, was, there was more, there were more, it struck me, there there's more to say about the food. And there are more comparisons to make about, you know, from, from I, I've traveled to Sicily and I know, that you know, when we were talking about the North African influences in, in on the Côte d'Azur cuisine, because of its connections to North Africa, and um, you've got the same thing in Sicily. Um, in, immediately you go to Sicily, the, the, you get chili back into foods, and you get mint and, uh, and yogurt and um, things that you wouldn't find in in, in most of Italy, um, and that's because of its proximity to uh, to, to Libya and to the, to the North African coast. And part of, of the first story has a, has a, a connection to, to Sicily. So that might, be, um, that might be the next bit of the journey, I think. It's great that you can see a future for these characters in 2019. So you finished writing your books and your drafts, and I can really understand how you might get to a point where you've had enough of editing and what have you. But you, so you've got your final draft. What does one then do with it? Well, because of the, of the, the power of the internet now and Amazon's uh, creation of, of something called Kindle Direct Publishing, um, anybody can publish their own book. Um, uh, they've made the process, and this is fairly recent um, uh, development, almost in, in parallel with me writing this book, um, the, these services have, have become live, but now you you, you can pretty much add a, a, a word manuscript uh, into Amazon, into in the Kindle Direct Publishing, and upload it, and uh, and they help in formatting it into a, into a book and a, an electronic book, an ebook, so it can be read on uh, on Mac or uh, on Kindle. So mine is is, is available as both. It's a hardback, um, a, a paperback. Uh, and and an ebook. How did you feel when that book came through the door, through the post, and you sort of had that first hard copy? It is. It kind of is, as you'd expect, pretty special um, to see it. I, 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 I really was pleased with the with the look of the book and the cover. Uh, lots of people, Linda, Linda McCluskey, the American artist who I mentioned earlier, she she painted the image on the cover, and 
and another old friend of mine from from my magazine career early on in life uh, he'd uh, he'd done the graphics for it and when I saw it all come together as, as a finished product I was, I was really really pleased I actually had to go to Monaco to, to pick it up because the Italian post is not so reliable sometimes uh, I got it shipped to uh, to Monaco and we drove over there one day and a, a friend had um, uh, had taken it so a nice lunch and celebrate <laughs> that's very Cote d'Azur isn't it picking up your first book from Monaco is it an expensive process to print your own book to have them published on Amazon uh, no it's not because it's it, it's printed on demand so that the, they've got a, a, modern, a modern digital press that almost as somebody clicks the button to buy one it prints one so there's no stock there's no set of costs as, as there used to be with traditional press no plates are to be made and there are there's no stock to be kept so they don't have to do a run of 10,000 which adds an element of risk to it so that they because they're, they're printing them as they're ordered and yet you can still get it the next day it's, it's quite incredible and that's across uh, I don't know how many countries I mean my book has sold in six countries so far um, that's so uh, cool <laughs> uh, it, it seems incredible you know I mean I, I don't know why and again because of the statistics because it's it's, it's real time I can I can see sales in in, in, in real time um, so if somebody buys a copy in, in Germany this afternoon, as, as somebody did recently, you know, I'll, it'll pop up on my screen, one copy sold. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's absolutely so incredible. It, it is incredible. And, and it, it means that when you do, when you're involved in marketing initiatives, uh, you see what works. You know, if I, if, I, if I post something on Facebook, as I did recently, I did a, a kind of Valentine promotion suggesting that, you know, my book with some Italian chocolate and a bottle of Prosecco might be a nice Valentine. Um, gift. Uh, I could see an instant response when uh, when somebody bought a copy. Uh, so it was. Uh, yeah. it Imagine we've got people listening who are thinking about writing a book. What tips would you impart to us? Yeah, I mean, do some do some research. Um, uh, certainly, um, the, the resources I stumbled across, which were um, uh, Harry Bingham's book um, uh, and his uh, video tutorials, which are online. Uh, I found invaluable, um, and um, I think if you uh, absorb those, you'd, you'd have a pretty good framework for for writing a book. Some of the most difficult bits were the, you know, with the editing and rewriting. That felt more like w- work than than writing. The writing felt like a, like a hobby. Uh, it was quite enjoyable most of the time. But the the, the editing and, and 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 to some extent the the detail of adding copyright notices and things like that are you know, it feels a bit like a job, but you know, not like anything. There's no, there's no gain without pain. But yeah, I don't think there's, there's no barriers really to anybody wanting to publish their own book. You know, and of course, the, the downside of that is that there's a lot of content out there that you know would have benefited from some, um, you know, some some research or some structure. But again, because ebooks are so cheap now, mine is is 99 pence or uh, 99 cents on on uh, on Amazon. People aren't making a big investment in them, so they, they feel as though they perhaps don't need to spend as much time considering that purchase. And people buy, I, I understand, you know, they commonly buy five ebooks, you know, for a pound uh, and stop reading two or three of them in the first couple of chapters because they don't feel that, that you know, they're up to the standard or they're, they're not what they were looking for and they're happy to abandon them because they've got so little investment in them. I think there's, there's a trend coming back for real books though. I'm in a book club and we do read things on Kindle, particularly if uh, they are expensive to buy and get shipped over. But I, when we're sort of doing our, oh, what happened next in the book and our discussions, anyone that's read it on Kindle seems to not remember it as well as people that actually had the physical book, interestingly. It's not scientifically proven, but that's just our little <laughs> finger in the air thing. Yeah, well, that's an interesting phenomenon. If there's something behind that. Yeah. I'm, I've started using both. I, I'm, so I've got a foot in both camps. I hadn't noticed uh, any real difference, um, other than clearly the, the convenience of, of, um, of the Kindle. But I must admit, uh, I do still like a physical book. It's like a magazine, isn't it? There's something quite tactile uh, yeah. uh, about, you know, glossy paper and, you know, nice imagery. Uh, and certainly you lose a little bit of that. Although on the Kindle, an image in the beginning of my book, there is 
I, again, I got the artist Linda McCluskey to, to do a, a map. It illustrates the journey that the protagonist takes from his, from his arrival in Nice along the coast and up to Saborga and then a later journey that they take into Piedmont. Um, and to the University of uh, Gastronomic Science. And she's done a kind of cartoony map of that journey, showing uh, where they're hunting the wild boar and some of the wines. So in the paper version, that unfortunately, is, first of all, it's split across two pages, and it's only in black and white. On the Kindle version, it's in color. And also in the Kindle version, I can add hyperlinks. So on the Kindle version, it is um, possible to add video. Uh, to, to add elements uh, of media to the, to to a book that you know was never possible before, so that that's that's going to be interesting. I hadn't really thought of that when I launched the ebook, but I do intend to revisit it and add in some additional material. And also, it means that you know if 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 there's a demand for more recipes, you can actually go back and add them, and you can add photographs. And, um, uh, yeah, you could have the locals making focaccia or something and uh, having that vision. Exactly, yes. It, be it, it, it becomes a, a multidimensional thing, yeah. Um, I think there's plenty of life left in, in, in squeezing ink on the paper. Um, yeah. I think I've probably sold as many hard copies as, as Kindle versions. I think it's about equal. It's very to, interesting. Uh, what I'm Obviously, this has been a great way for you to meet the locals and chat to people and get more integrated into local life have you got any other tips for people on how to make connections and settle down because it is really hard it can be quite overwhelming when you arrive in a new country trying to settle down we didn't find it particularly difficult in italy we have a, a, a wide range of friends from from all different countries um you know scandinavians and um some from eastern europe yeah i mean quite wide ranging we have a dog and i think <laughs> Dogs are always, uh, you know, people tend to talk, would tend to talk to you if, you if you're out walking a dog, well, they might not if you're on your own. Uh, uh, and the same in restaurants as well. They, they tend to strike up conversations with a, um, with a pet first. So my prime objective, really, in, in, in writing this story was to, was to tell the story of Saborga and, uh, and to hopefully... Uh, help promote this this idea of, of food tourism uh, and bring people into the into the village to create you know this kind of sustainable economy, and it's actually already starting to work. We've already had I've already had two sets of readers, uh, one one of who's made the journey already, and the other one's planning uh, the the trip. On both of them, on on the back of the story. Um, That's fabulous. I and if you it. read the Amazon reviews, I think two thirds or perhaps more of the Amazon reviews all say that they all intend to, all want to or intend to visit on the strength of the story. And if that turns out to be true, then, then that's fulfilled my objective. <laughs> and I can't wait to get there now. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It totally is inspiring. And I'm not a huge meat eater. So I love Italian food uh, because you can get away with not eating meat actually in Italy uh, which is a little bit harder in France uh, although it's changing brilliant I can't wait I'll, I'll have to get in contact with you before I come and come and get an autograph in my book on my Kindle or something <laughs> and you'd be very welcome uh, I'm sure the uh, and come and, and, and come and meet the, uh, the princess Nina I'm sure would be delighted to to come, come and meet you well I would love that very much <laughs> uh, when you're not reading your own book what would you be reading well I, actually I've read a few of Annie Hawes' books uh, William Boyd is uh, something we've, we've been reading quite a few of recently in, in terms of non-fiction stuff I, I'm a big fan of A.A. Gill um, the late A.A. Gill um, uh, who used to you know, I discovered through his columns in the Sunday Times but I've read several of his books Table Talk um, by A.A. Gill is by far my favorite it's one of the cleverest funniest things i've ever ever read and i can reread it now and it still has me in hysterics <laughs> um the way in which he, he he kind of can sum up a nation and its cuisine and in a few clever sentences is very very funny well i'm going to put that in the link uh, as a link in the show notes because what we're trying to do is build up a, a link of recommended books because it can get quite difficult and quite overwhelming when you look on amazon or wherever and looking for a good read it's a great thing that we suggest to people to make new friends is to create a book club and why not read cooking up a country available 
on Amazon. So literally you just go to Amazon and you put kicking up a country. I did it myself and it says, do you want to buy the, the hard copy or like you say, the Kindle copy is on a promotion deal at the moment at 99 cents, which is fabulous. And I then just got it straight away on my computer on my great read and what I like is it ticks several boxes so the historical side the romantic but also the foodie so it kind of appeals to both men and women it doesn't seem to be that it's tailored to to one or the other how can people get in contact with you um, on through Facebook um, we, we have a Facebook page for the uh, for the book um, um, uh, cooking up a country and and I, I'm continuing to post on there fairly recent fairly frequently as the food journey continues and, and, and the story of Saboga, you know, I'm, you know, there's always something amazing happening in the village that produces great photo opportunities. I mean, before we came away, there was the chestnut festival where they're roasting chestnuts on a big pan in the, uh, in the piazza. And then we have ceremonial events where the prince and the princess will quite often ride out on horseback around the village, which is pretty spectacular with their entourage of military escort quite a spectacle well i can't wait to come and see it for myself i wish you every bit of luck with the ongoing launch and promotion of your book it's been great to have my first author on here and also just for sharing that it's you've got to have the idea obviously and that's the hard part but doing your book is actually a really simple process and it's something that we can all do and it's such a creative thing and such a creative way to get your message out there and, and it must just be that amazing experience of, of feeling your first hard copy in your hand. I'm really inspired and I think I really want to write a book. I just need to think of my idea now. <laughs> yes, it's like a key, a key is, is a, a, a strong story, that's the thing. Uh, good, good writing without a, a story at its core is, is pretty pointless. You need a good, good theme. Well, we wish you all the well, James, with everything and look forward to meeting you one day in Saboga. Thanks for joining the podcast. Indeed. Thank you. All in English for 0 to 16 year olds from baby clubs and playgroups to English lessons and holiday camps. They even hold workshops for adults too, right here on the Codesio. You can find out more about Kiduland directly on their website www.kiduland.com. So thanks for listening. Please do pay it forward and share an episode so we can spread the Codesio alert. Until next time, Fireflies, au revoir.